uh, title of our message this morning is Maintaining Good Connections. Maintaining Good Connections. But that's the second part, if that's okay. We'll get through the first part, and then that'll be the second part. So I want to just make, uh, as, as part of a preamble, talk about my own personal experience with the Lord and my challenge with the Bible. Preaching, and I've sat through and now done a lot of it, is to help us better understand how, the, how life in the kingdom of God works. Because it's a foreign thing for us. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven has come to you. And preaching is supposed to help you get the most out of it. How many are glad about that? Spiritual things don't come naturally to humans, even though the processes themselves are very natural. For example, we don't imbibe the Bible by sitting next to it. You have to read it. Do you agree? And you can't read it tired because if your brain's not working, nothing goes in. Or if it does go in, it goes in one ear and straight out the other. Fasting is very spiritual, do you agree? But if we tie nothing to it, it's only dieting. Come on, saints. The spirit, the spirit world uses very natural, very practical things, but if you tie spiritual things to them, you will grow powerful and you'll grow strong. The contrast that we're offered in Scripture is someone who is an infant in the things of God and someone who is maturing in the things of God. Not that anyone ever arrives. If anyone could have said that, perhaps... The Apostle Paul could have slipped into that category, but he said, not that I have already arrived. Yeah? And the author of a big chunk of the New Testament, if he's to say that, then the majority of us would not be able to make that claim either. I want you to notice this. Many times knowledge comes on the back of us proving a truth is right, whether through a practice or through neglect. You can prove a spiritual practice, you can prove a truth if you put it into practice and if you neglect to put it into practice. Because the Bible says there are blessings associated with doing and there are cursings associated with not doing. So you can learn either way. This is a goal I say of myself. You could write this down. The Bible talks about our new nature in Christ. And our new nature in Christ, for us as humans, is now our second nature. You with me? And my goal as a Christian is to make my second nature my first response. Come on, saints. That's the goal of Christianity, because God says, now inhabiting my person, I want you to be more Christ-like, even though the world around you hasn't changed. Now that you're a Christian... I want you to be more Christ-like like like in your seeing, saying, and doing. So I want my second nature to become my first response. And that's the art, if you could call it that, of maturing as a Christian. I love this statement. Come apart and rest, or you'll plain come apart. Now you can prove that in the doing... Or you can prove it in the neglecting. If you don't come apart and rest with the Lord, your spiritual life will come apart. You can prove it in the doing and you can prove it in the neglect of it. As with most spiritual principles. I have a work day, just like everyone else. And I'm amazed how much smoother my work day is when I commit it to the Lord first thing. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will then succeed. You can prove it in the doing or you can prove it in the neglect. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will succeed. I have a responsibility in my home. I've had four kids and one of my responsibilities as a dad is to show them what living in the kingdom of God is like. Every parent's responsibility to put into practice what the Bible teaches. Matthias now 18, and she got her first jury service the other day. 
You've got to, you know what it's like. You've got to sign up. You send your form away and they'll pick you or they won't pick you. So she had to give her work a uh, notification that she would be away for two weeks. And as a casual, I'm glad she's a casual because she's very casual. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. As a casual, you know if you're not working, you're not, you're not earning. I felt, I felt this. And many a Christian will say that. I felt impressed to do this. She came home the first day and she said, Dad, I wasn't picked. And I felt impressed to say to her, darling, ring work. Ring work right now and say that if I don't get picked tomorrow, is work available for me? Of the nine days she was on jury duty, she didn't get picked at all and she worked seven. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will succeed. So rather than having to stay home for nine days while she's on jury service, she was away too and worked seven. And you know what she learned? A great lesson about the kingdom of God and how it's supposed to benefit you. Come on, saints. We are Christian. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is now in you. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So here's some of the challenges. If you're going to understand the Bible, to understand it, you have to understand a little of the culture and the time in which it was written. These two cultures that are of interest to us are on the other side of the world. They are the Israelites and the Roman culture. And many of the writings in the, in the Old New Testament are from there. But listen to this. The writers gave us about five important subjects for us to know and in some respects master. They use common day-to-day -day things for Christians to understand and explore their newfound faith. The first is an understanding of agriculture. And you and I both know, as soon as I say that, you go, oh, yes, of course. So much of the New Testament comes to us with you having an understanding of how agriculture works. I'll give you an example. We hear teaching on the seed and the soil. We hear about roots and we hear about fruits. We're told Jesus is the true vine and you and I are his branches. And we're to watch out for the second tears. Amen. The second obvious stands out to us is about builders and buildings. We are reminded that God is a builder. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, all your labor is in vain. That's a powerful truth. Would you agree? He says God is a builder and we are his building. He says, and the principle sound, make sure that the foundations are good for when the storms come. And he also says, be careful that you build brick by brick, line upon line, and precept upon precept. What qualifies you to do what I do is that you know this. What qualifies you to do what you do is that you know the word. You've got to know the word. That's how the kingdom of heaven works for you. The third one, you might be interesting to notice this. The, the third one is, is built around an idea of nautical things. So I'll give you an example. Paul said that we could be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, like a small boat caught on the sea. And how many have ever been caught in a storm? And you felt like your face being knocked to and fro. He also said that it's possible, if you don't guard your conscience, that you could shipwreck your faith. The writer of Hebrews says of your faith that your confession of hope is an anchor for your soul, both sure and steadfast, and enters the presence beyond the veil. That's pretty good, am I right? And as soon as I say that, you're like, well, of course, boats have anchors, and they've got to be careful the seas that they're on. Yes, I get all of that. Isn't it amazing how it all fits together? The fourth one is you have to understand a little bit of athletics. Not do, thank goodness for Christians. Just listen and understand the principle. Because Paul says, run your race. He says, fight your fight. Finish your course and finish well. Another one. He says, in spiritual things, discipline your body. You know why the church of Jesus Christ at large in the world doesn't pray? 
It's not because we're not spiritual. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the body needs discipline. Because like I said, spiritual things don't come naturally to us humans. We have to discipline our body. And when you come to pray, that's not a time to sleep. It's a time to say, like our pastor says. When you pray, say. And then there's this other one that I've been meditating on for some time now. It's this idea of military concepts. Paul says in 2, in 2 Timothy, turn with me there, that we are to be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives us principles on how to be that. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let me know what a charge is. It's a, it's a, a, a reinforced encouragement. Do you know the one, of my, one of the most common charges of Scripture is? As soon as I say it, you go, of course. Be strong. Be strong in the grace. Be strong and courageous. Only be strong. All the writers use this idea of being strong. You know why? Because the idea built into the word in the Bible is be strong in your covenant. How many of you got a good marriage? If you got a good marriage, I guarantee you're strong in the covenant. And that's why you got a good marriage. Do you agree? If you're a good Christian, I guarantee you that you're strong in your covenant with the Lord Jesus. I guarantee you. How powerful is communion? It's us honoring the covenant with the Lord Jesus. There's a word in the third verse it says, and don't be entangled. I want you to think about that just for, for a minute. It says, those soldiers who've been enlisted, we're talking about the Lord Jesus and us, will not be entangled. You know what that word means? Involved with someone. Or involved with something. You know what I've noticed? 25 years in this church, ministering to people, mostly young people. You know what challenges covenant more than anything else? I see hearts drift. Bodies get displaced. I start to ask questions. And people say this. I guarantee you they say this. I'm involved with someone. Come on, saints. That's what happens. I'm involved in something. You're not coming to prayer anymore. Oh, I'm involved in something. I don't see you anymore. What's going on? Oh, I'm involved with someone. That's what entangled means. And you and I got to be careful. The Bible says if you're going to be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus, you got to be careful not to be entangled. We got to be honest with ourselves and say, this thing or this one is going to entangle me in my faith. And you know, before I get to you, you already know you got entangled. You got entangled. Yeah? And those entanglements can lead to besetting sins where you stay entangled. Heaven help us. Have you ever seen on the TV or seen in a book a picture of a fisherman trying to untangle his fishing net? And you think to yourself, what a mess. The Bible says, and don't be entangled. Don't be entangled. That's why I got my extension leads up here. Because I've got to tell you something. I've spent a good deal of time untangling my extension leads. You know when they say on the side of your garden hose, there's only a 20% chance that it'll kink? or get twisted, or get entangled. Guess who lives in my yard? I've never actually seen him, but I've seen his work. A guy called Murphy. And Murphy's law is that he's always going to get tangled. I can't believe it. I can't believe I can walk my extension lead through a barren wasteland and get hooked on a root. I'm like, how does that work? And I'm almost there. Isn't that funny? I'm almost where it needs to be. You've got to backtrack all the way back. Don't. Be entangled. 
And it can be the simplest of things that distract us from our core purpose. And I'll get to this and explain real quick. Our core purpose is to supply the power of God to the world. That's our core purpose. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the hope of the church. That's the privilege of the church. That's the responsibility of the church. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Have a listen to this. I'm going to focus in on one word here for you as well. From verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong. What does that word mean? Strong in your covenant. Strong in your covenant. Strong in your covenant. Do you know you can know the Bible back to front and not be strong in your covenant with the Lord? So it's not about knowing the Bible. The Bible says you search the Scriptures. Jesus said you search the Scriptures. Within them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. In any given sermon, I could quote about 20 verses to you, and you hear me. I know them off by heart, but not just know them off by heart. I know them in my heart. I know them in my heart. I've applied them. I've lived them. I've learned them. They're truths that we live by. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That word power there is ergon. How many have a a living, vibrant relationship with ergon? How many are glad for that intimate relationship? How many are glad for that strong covenant? How many are glad they supply power to you? If they were the kingdom of heaven, aren't you glad there's a good connection to your house? Good, strong supply. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. I want you to underline that word wiles for me. When I was a kid, I used to watch a cartoon. It was this crazy coyote called Wiley. And he was always after a roadrunner. And I imagine it was like Red Rooster Chicken or Kentucky Fried. I think think that's what he was thinking in his mind. Oh man, once I get this bird on the grill. He spent his whole life trying to get that roadrunner. And they wrote the stories about the Wiley Coyote. And the Bible says here that you and I have to stand against the wiles of the devil. The idea there is his methods, his strategies, his plans. What did the wily coyote always have? A strategy, a plan. I got something going on, I'm going to get him this time. And the Bible says that you and I have to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. If our world is falling down around us, it is our responsibility as a church to come together and pray that the kingdom of God would manifest in our world. Because only God can put this thing back together. But he's yoked his power, his awesome power to the church. And through us, the power is delivered. What a responsibility. Do you agree, saints? But we have an enemy, an internal enemy called my soul, and it's wanton desire that's influenced by the world around it, and the devil that's constantly trying to trip me up because he's got a plan, because he's got a strategy. That wily coyote is trying to undermine the integrity of your faith. That wily coyote. Because if he can poke a hole in your faith, he can weaken its integrity. And he can ruin your confidence when you stand before the Lord. And make a great claim on behalf of your community. Lord, would you move in our city? Lord, would you move in our neighborhood? Lord, Lord, would you move in my street with great power and authority? Would the kingdom of heaven manifest in this town? Oh, I can't say that. I've been struggling with Wally Coyote this week. He's been undermining my faith. He's been poking holes in my integrity. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Have you ready for lunch? 10 o'clock. I can see Lordy, Lordy Maloney getting a bit antsy. He must have a roast on. 
Hallelujah. I'm only joking. And then he says this, talking about the military side of things. Listen to this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you're able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. Can you imagine being a soldier for the Lord and not having this stuff with you? Come on, saints. What? And then one of the most important ones. And take the helmet of salvation, the helmet of hope, the Bible calls it, the helmet of hope. <laughs> Love it. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In another place, I think it's Corinthians. Paul uses another word for the devil's work. And he makes this statement about us and puts it in the positive. Even though sometimes we're in the negative. He said, I know you saints that you are not ignorant of the devil's devices. I know you guys, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Even though in this true, a lot of times we are. That wily coyote, when he gets up in the morning, I know he doesn't sleep all night, I know that. I know what the Bible says. That wily coyote, when he gets up in the morning, he's got a plan. He's got a strategy. He's got a method. What's his goal? To undermine the integrity of your faith. And what's your goal as a Christian? To make your new nature in Christ your first response in the world. I mean, you struggle with that every now and then. Yeah? There's a word for that. The Bible calls it being carnal. Don't get mad. It's a thing. It's okay. That simply means that you're still on the journey from infancy to progressively becoming mature. But in that process, that's where the wily coyote comes along and he says, you know what? I'm going to undermine you right now. I'm going to trip you up right now. I'm going to seek to entangle you right now with a something or a someone. And I know right now that God's already speaking to hearts about those some things and those some ones. I know it. I know it. You know why? Because every day I have to manage my own soul and say, like David, if there's anything or anyone that's undermining the integrity of my love covenant with you, Lord, then you've got to remove it from my heart. Because it could be a TV show. It could be a sport. It could be a comfort. It doesn't even have to be a sin. It could just be a comfort. And because of that thing, your faith is not growing. Paul said, often, you know this, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I just make it up now. <laughs> he says, I would love to come to you and share some truth with you, but I can't because you're not spiritual, only carnal. Would to God that you were spiritual, but you're not. You're still in process. And if it was a pendulum, he'd say, you're more this way than you are this way. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Have a listen to this. That word device there. Is something imposed to stop the flow? Huh? We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. That idea there is he's going to put something in the way that stops the flow. I wonder what flow he would be concerned about through you into your world. Maybe God's awesome power and grace and joy and peace that has transformed your life and mine. He does not want more of that in the world. Come on, saints. So he's doing everything he can to put a device in the way that stops the flow. Everything he can. As you know, I was reading a military book. 
about this because I have no understanding. I'm not a military person. I have no understanding of first century military paraphernalia or whatever. And I was trying to understand where Paul got his insights from. And one of the ideas, as you know, was about you as a person and your activities with the sword. And you had to have a good eye, a good heart, a good stance, and a good grip. And I thought that was great. That was powerful. And he went on to explain a few things about that, about your balance, your center of gravity, the whole thing. And then he says this big but. And he says, always fight with your advantage in mind. And we're not to talk about the size of a person, the speed of a person, whatever. You can, you can imagine that would be a thing in a battle. And he says this, are you ready? You have to write this down. For example, not a Christian man, for example, always fight with the sun at your back. I was done. I read S-U-N and saw S-O-N. I thought, what? <laughs> He's just given us Christianity in a package right there. If you're ever going to go into a spiritual battle, make sure the sun's got your back. Come on, saints. I thought you'd be on your chairs right there. Imagine that flash of steel, metaphorically, and that glint in his eyes, and looking at you but seeing the sun. Come on, saints. Why does the Bible say of the church that we are invincible? Because the sun's got our back. And the sun is the one that took him all the way and said, I'm going to defeat you at the cross. And you're not going to rise again. And all he's left with, all he's left with in our lives is something that entangles us. A little device that he tries to slip in the way to stop the flow. Come on, saints. We have a real enemy. But the sun's got our back. If I was a dancer, I'd be dancing right now. Always remember church in a spiritual battle. The sun's got your back. The sun's got your back. The sun's got your back. And we, as the Bible says, and we glory in the cross. We remind the devil he's defeated. He's got no power over our lives other than what we give to him ourselves. Because all, all he's got, that wily coyote, is those little devices. And you and I know what they are. We've seen them before. We've seen their work. We've seen them stop the flow. Come on, saints. We've seen them stop the flow. You rat of a devil. And you know what we've got to do? We've got to go back. And we've got to reapply what we've learned. Because you can learn through neglect. And you can prove through doing. We've got to go back to those things that we've learned. A little bit more prayer. A little bit more fasting. A little bit more reading. A little bit more study. We've got to get that device out of the road. And we've got to restart the flow. Yeah. Imagine the church in a person, Samson. And the Bible says of this. Man, he did not know that the Spirit of the Lord had left him. Can you imagine a church who gathers on a Sunday and is indifferent to whether Jesus turns up in his presence or not? Because it's no longer about the flow. Come on, son. it's no longer about the flow. I'm glad that this pulpit has a flow of grace from it. I'm glad that there's a healing power and a grace in our praise and in our worship. I'm glad the presence of God manifests on a Sunday morning. I'm glad that the devil can't stop the flow. Because the flow is what it's all about. Amen? The flow, the flow. Hallelujah. I'm on the last page. You doing okay? Have a listen to this. The devil works with this device. He offers, it says it's, a bit, it's his ability. He offers a contrary thought. And if you look at his works all through the scriptures, you know what he does all the time. Because he has no power outside of what we give him. He offers a contrary thought. Eve has a statement. The devil has a contrary thought. Jesus makes a statement. The devil has a contrary thought. You make a statement. The devil has a contrary thought. 
And if you dwell on that contrary thought, you know what comes into your life? Doubts, fears, unbelief. Paul says, outside of conflicts, inside of fears. If you dwell on that contrary thought, you know what it'll do? It'll undermine, you know the word, it'll undermine the integrity of your faith. And you all know that is absolutely true. I have proved that in the doing, or I've proved that in the neglect. Yeah, the devil has an ability to offer a contrary thought. It's how he works. That wily coyote. In 1 Kings 20, all through the New Testament, the Bible says that the church is to press home its advantage. The Bible says in Ephesians, deal with your anger lest you give a mighty foothold to the devil. Another translation says you'll give your advantage to the devil. We say of a football team, a basketball team, that they have a home field advantage, a home crowd advantage. Do you know what you and I have? We've got the sun at our back. Come on, saints. We've got the sun at our back. That's the advantage. He died on the cross for our sins. You and I are free for an eternity. Hallelujah. The devil can't stop the flow unless you start to believe the contrary thought. The devil can't stop the flow unless you and I start to believe the contrary thought. In 1 Kings 20... Verse 22, this is how it works. The Bible says of the prophet, 1 Kings 20, verse 22, I said that, didn't I? And it says, and the prophet says, in the new year, you're going to experience a second attack. So, between now and then, are you ready? Let me take notes. Strengthen yourself, in brackets, for the battle. Make the necessary preparations do what must be done, another translation says. Here's another one for you, modernized version, you're ready. Secure your supply lines. Secure your supply lines. Pastor, Pastor Greg Russell. <laughs> Sorry, brother. Greg Russell would know this intimately. Do you know how important supply lines are in your military strategy? They're not important, they're critical. Do you know what the devil tries to get us to do? Become ignorant of our supply lines. I'm ready. Bring it on, devil. I'll take you front on. Not realizing if, you, if he's undermined your supply lines, the power's been cut off because you are going to run out unless you remind yourself often that the sun is at your back. The sun is at your back. The sun is at your back. Strengthen yourself. Make the necessary preparations. Do what must be done. Secure your supply lines. Oh, I love that. I love that. I humbly apologize to Scotty for everything I say from now on that is wrong about electricity. You know, it's amazing. And I don't mean to dumb it down. But the challenge with, pre with preaching is to make the, the idea, bring it out in its simplest form. You and I have a responsibility and a privilege to become an extension of the kingdom of God in our world. One of my Bible college lecturers said it like this. And I loved it. He was talking about uh, Matthew 6. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, let me, let me present this idea to you. The kingdom of heaven is the range of God's effective will. I really like that. I really like that. Because we often talk about the power of God coming upon our lives, that we're under his influence, that the power has gotten to us. But there are times when things are outside the range of his effective will. Because he, I can't believe he did this. He submitted his work on earth to the activity of the church. Come on, saints. He limited his activity on the earth to the church. This building has power in it. 
Every PowerPoint in this building has power behind it. But you and I access it through a good connection. Come on, saints. We access it through a good connection. And you and I both know, I don't matter if you're in, in early in the morning, your phone's gone flat, and you're reaching out with your charger, and you just can't get to the PowerPoint until you have a good connection. It doesn't matter how much power is in your walls. Come on, saints. It doesn't matter how much power is in your walls until you make a good connection. And then what's your challenge? Maintaining good connections. Maintaining good connections. I remember my uncle, we lived on a farm. He said to me one day, I need you to paint some of the machinery. I was maybe 11 or 12 or something. And I knew all the basics. It needs the compressor, it needs the paint thing. I need the paint. And he said, the, the, the big thing I want you to paint up on this shit, I won't get into all the details. I knew what they were, but the great big massive steel thing. So I went and got every single extension lead I could on the farm. And that thing would have been, I don't know, 300, 400 meters up the paddock. And I hadn't gone maybe 70 or 80 meters. Now, Scotty would say, please don't tell me you plugged that thing in. I did. I did. Do you know it's our challenge? I'll, I'll finish the story real quick. My uncle got home about 6 o'clock that evening. I'd done nothing all day. Even though I said to him, I've searched all day for extension leads, and I've plugged them all together. I've got a good connection all the way back to the house. I'm not even halfway there, and the job's not done. You know what he did? He went and got the tractor, picked up the machinery, and pulled it closer to the house. And I thought to myself, what did I think of that? How cool is that? Let me tell you what happened. He moved the machinery into the range of the effective will. He moved the machinery into the range of the effective will. You and I have a privilege and a responsibility. We don't... We don't have the power in us, but the power is supplied through us. You know what this is? As simply as it is, this is a supply line. It doesn't have any power in it. But when it's connected, when it's got a good connection, oh, wow. You and I have power in us, don't we? You and I have power in us. We have power in us. I'll tell you why. We're connected back to the sun we're connected back to the sun and as so long as we don't go outside the range of his effective will there's power available hallelujah you know what you know what our challenge listen 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 to the words we use oh my goodness i've been stretched too thin come on saints i've been spread out too thin our job is to stay connected so that this end has always got a supply it's always got a supply. I'll tell you what our world needs more than anything else. The kingdom of heaven to come upon it. The kingdom of heaven to come upon it. The righteousness, peace, and joy of God. And the devil is seeking to undermine it by putting little devices in the way that stop the flow. Stop the flow. You know. Scotty would tell you, you know. When there's good integrity in your connection, you know. If I ring him, he'll often say, you got a good connection? Why? Because he knows without a good connection, there'll be no flow. Amen. Singers and musicians, if you could come. Here's an interesting thought. It's got nothing to do with Christianity or spirituality. I just thought it was an interesting observation. You know how I get all the kinks out of my extension lead? I lay it out in the sun. I lay it out in the sun. You and I don't spend anywhere near enough time laying out in the sun and saying, Lord, too many kinks in me. I went off the other day. My second nature was not my first response. I got angry. I got frustrated. Iron those kinks out again, Lord, because I want to be a supplier power to my world. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, saints.